I'm not going to use it. So, but you know, if, if it is like a two-year-old machine that um, you know the company is like, well, we can't get. I, I found this interesting. I remember when I was when I was starting to do some work with them when I was at college. I was like, well, why would you take this three-year-old machine? Like it's you know perfectly fine and fast. And one of the issues was, well, you know, in terms of their support both internally and externally with external companies. Um, the companies were like, you know, after a two or three year um, cycle, they wanted to support newer hardware. And that's how they wanted to, to, to rule their, um, their environment. And so um, as a result, you know, to make sure that they had the, the external hardware support, um, they basically, um, you know, wanted to um, donate or otherwise, um, you know, distribute the hardware elsewhere. So it's a win-win situation, I guess, for both groups. Both groups. Really? Drove between Open Office to LibreOffice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that? I'm kind of curious about how did that actually. I know some of how that came yeah, about. Yeah, sure. But did that? How did that, did that affect any of the things that you do in any good or negative or oh, way? Or how did that? Yeah, how sure. Thank you. <laughs> it's a really hard question that I answer all the time. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. so, so, um, yeah. So, what happened was that um, Sun bought Star Office, Star Division, um, which created an office suite. Um, because they had a lot of people and they said, instead of buying licenses from Microsoft, why don't we just buy a company that makes an office suite? Which, you know, if you're thinking on a macro scale, I guess that makes sense. Usually I don't buy companies, but you know, when I do, I buy office suites. Um, so, <laughs> but, so they bought this company, um, Star Division, and they released OpenOffice, and that was um, around, I think, 2000. So that was originally was a closed source that they, op that yeah, they open sourced yeah, they that open project? Yeah, that then? project, yeah. Okay. And that was um, it's one, of the, one of the ways that open source projects were born. Um, and, um, but you know, there, there was a certain amount of baggage with the project at that point. Um, a lot of the code was, because Star Division was out of Germany, a lot of the comments were in German. Um, and that persisted uh, largely, some to, until this day, but um, largely through um, the history of OpenOffice until 2010 when LibreOffice forked off. And LibreOffice forked for a variety of reasons. Um, the community wanted to have more involvement um, from a management uh, sort of position on the board from a number of different players. Um, you know, Sun said, we want to create this open source project, and they put a lot of stock into involving the community. But I think Sun had this sort of weird dual duality where they wanted to sell Star Office and then let people use open office, but then maybe not necessarily build a business around open office. So this created an issue where there were people that say wanted to support. We're out here. I'm the presenter. It's all good. <laughs> you can come in. I'm just talking about the history of LibreOffice and OpenOffice. So, um, so yeah. So basically, um, a number of people wanted to create consultancies um, and other businesses around OpenOffice because you know they thought, hey, I can provide support. I can provide technical um, expertise. Uh, I can improve it. Um, but Sun wanted to have a slightly different business model, and. Sun was an okay company, I think. Um, they made some promises, but when Sun got bought up by Oracle, I think people sort of were concerned, one, that those promises would never be fulfilled, and two, they weren't sure that Oracle was going to invest, continue investing in OpenOffice, and they didn't want to see it sort of slide off into obscurity. So they made a decisive point, created a nonprofit foundation, designed it such that no one company could hold more than a third of the board seats. So writing into the, into the rules, the base rules that um, one of the biggest complaints they had that you know Sun was sort of in charge of things, so that created LibreOffice, um, and there are a lot more pieces to it. For example, all the Linux distros had a patched version of OpenOffice. So whenever your distro said OpenOffice, it was really OpenOffice plus a patch set. Um, and the reason the patch set existed was largely because of this contributor license agreement Sun had. So they either didn't want or contributors didn't want to push up um, code to uh, hey to the main line. So when LibreOffice was created. Um, we didn't need to have an external patch set anymore. So the Linux distro maintainers, hooray, we're very happy about that. And we will get started shortly. Hey, <laughs> okay. well, free open source software is tricky at times, huh? Um, is there a higher? I feel like I can like kneel down here and see my, see my slides. OK. All right, so um, yeah, so my presentation is on what's preventing your organization from using uh, freedom, of source, freedom of source software. Um, we're at the GNU Linux conference. so. Hopefully, we'll see a lot of free software being used here. Um, and, you know, free open source software is obviously part of what we do. Um, and there's still a lot of proprietary software we're using um, in everything we do. Um, Karen pointed out that sometimes it's a part of our things that we can't even escape, can't even get away from. So um, it can be really challenging uh, to use open alternatives, but it's something that I think we um, should try to invest some time in and should try to make. Uh, a best effort to see when we can use um, alternatives. So I know that 
I've often faced the question of what, what can we do to get organizations we're involved in um, and maybe other people to use our open stuff. And I use stuff because obviously I'm, I usually talk about software, but this could include hardware, open data, um, whatever that you do that you think should be more, um, more open um, and you, you think that other people should, I think, be both more respectful and more uh, cognizant of what kind of rights they have and how they can use and share um, the tools um, that they're using. So just to step back, oh, my slide is displaying weirdly. Um, so my name is Robinson Tryon. Um, I do QA work. I live in Vermont, but I grew up here in the Northwest down in Portland. Um, so I know that, yes. So um, I know that, uh, especially up here, um, you know, it's kind of a Microsoft powerhouse. Um, I know people are talking about how um, on various campuses, there's obviously an effort to have a lot of Microsoft software. Um, when I went to school, we had this thing called the Microsoft Campus Agreement. Um, which basically meant that whenever a machine was sold, there was like this 80 bucks they tacked on. Um, and I thought this was especially interesting when one of the guys who worked in IT showed me that he bought a machine preloaded with Red Hat Linux on it, and it was going to spend its entire life cycle as a server. And it was like, we got the campus agreement tax on it. And I was like, it's never going to use Microsoft software. And they're like, well, our agreement is whenever you buy a machine, it has to have this agreement, even if it's not ever going to use the software as part of the agreement. So that was one of the first things I think that sparked me in terms of asking, why can't we use open source software? Um, not just the challenges to it, but also the question about, well, who's making these decisions for us? Um, so in LibreOffice, um, I'm a QA engineer. Um, I do marketing outreach. And as appeared very quickly on my slide, I chip in on all kinds of other, other bits and pieces. Um, so LibreOffice, um, as you, some of you guys know, has a lot of different components. Um, presentations, databases, etc. Um, I talked, I think, a little bit about this with many of you, um, and we're just talking about where LibreOffice came from. But we've got the Document Foundation, which is a nonprofit, um, and it supports and organizes LibreOffice, um, our Document Liberation Project, um, and some other efforts, all of which are under the guise of, of free software and open source software. So if you have any questions, obviously throw something at me. Um, and we might have some time at the end, although we got started a little late because the door was locked. Um, darn door DRM. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. Like maybe next time we'll have someone from Tool here. You guys know what Tool is? It's like the lock picking guys. And oh, yeah. They can, they can let us in, right? So that, that's like a different talk, right? Okay. So um, I think it's, it's important to talk about um, LibreOffice. Again, that's the context in which I work mostly um, to talk about um, free software and talk about what we can do to use free software and share free software. So the LibreOffice community is really diverse um, and we believe a lot of things as sort of a core part of our DNA. People should have um, the freedom to run software, you know, these are sort of the, the four freedoms, right? Um, free Software Foundation. Um, and we offer no cost downloads of LibreOffice. So we have a number of companies that are built up around LibreOffice, but we think that people should be able to use the software um, because it is a lifeline for a lot of people. It's being used by municipalities, by other entities. And we think that it's really important for people to have access to that data. Um, so that's the open data side of the openness. Um, and yes, everyone deserves those freedoms. So we have a lot of goals. Um, and I want to sort of go, go past these pretty quickly. But um, if you're interested in more about this, you can see online um, who we are. It's on our website. Um, providing uh, tools, uh, digital tools, I think is really important to uh, uh, bridge the digital divide and empower people because whereas we're all really lucky to be here, I think probably everyone in this room has access to um, hardware, laptops, and things like that. There are a lot of people out there that don't even have the opportunity to really have the discussion about free software because they don't have access to a computer in the first place. So I think that free software can be a mechanism for change. Um, you know, when we ask the question like, how can we use free software, sometimes we need to step back and say like, how can we get technology to people in the first place? So I think that um, if you're working with an organization and you want to have a discussion about free software, um, sometimes you need to have that discussion about technology first and ask them, you know, what can we do to, to have, give people access to um, technology? Encouraging uh, language support and participating in, in free software is also what we do. So are we avoiding proprietary software? Obviously, we should look in, in, inward first <laughs> before we, uh, we ask other people if they're using proprietary software. Um, largely, yes. Um, we're really trying to find good multi-person video chat. I run um, a lot of meetings, both with QA 
um, my job, and I also try to do stuff in the, in the US community. And uh, we'd love to have good browser-based video chat so we could see people. Um, there's no substitute for meeting people in person, but video chat is a close, um, close replacement. Uh, and we can't find anything yet. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have worked with WebRTC, um, other tools like that. It's just not there quite yet. Um, free software tools could definitely use a lot more polish um, to compete with the proprietary items out there. And you know, we're using some proprietary software because we're building for Windows, for Macintosh. I have a Mac that I use for testing. So um, we think that's really important to continue to support people who might not be able to use a free software operating system, like this lab, for example. Um, you know, people are going to want to use our software and maybe software that your organization creates. And so you want to create a balance between creating your software and forcing someone to use an operating system uh, or maybe say like a handheld device that they don't have access to or can't afford. So um, we would like to see people using LibreOffice more. Um, I obviously talk about that at conferences a lot. I've talked, I think, with some of you guys already about <laughs> what we could do to better support you. But um, that, comes with, um, that's, that comes with some, um, some barriers. Um, we welcome new participation, um, but you know, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of barriers we need to, uh, to address. I try to use software from other free software projects um, and promote what we use um, elsewhere. But again, it's, it's a pretty small community right now, I think. And so that's another challenge we face. So why aren't more people using it? So how many of you guys are using LibreOffice right now? Awesome. A little bit, some of you a little bit. OK, so um, you know, obviously, there's, there's a question, you know, is, it, is this something at home? I know for a lot of us, LibreOffice is easier to use at home, um, at work. Um, you know, is it a nonprofit? Obviously, you know, there are a lot of different places you could use um, free software, but it's difficult to use it consistently. Um, and I think it's also difficult because we face multiple challenges, including um, knowledge of it, file formats, and other, other components. Migrations. Um, have any of you guys ever proselytized for LibreOffice or other, <laughs> other free software? How did that go? Sometimes it kind of, once in a while, someone will change over and get excited about the yeah, idea of free yeah. software. And then other people are like, this is just too much. It's too okay. hard. This is a pain. I, I don't want to change my operating <laughs> system. Yeah. I know how Word works, and that's sure. fine sure. for their purposes. And they're not aware of the four freedoms oftentimes. Sure, things. exactly. Now, just, I mean, not to put you on the spot or anything, um, like, how competent do you feel um, or how... Um, yeah, like how do you feel about trying to talk about software freedom to somebody or about what the benefits of that could be? I have had mixed success because I'm, I'm really into free software. Yeah. And so like there's all, you know, these security issues. But most recently I actually talked to my, my father and his partner in the 60s and 70s and told them just starting with the four freedoms. And yeah. they seemed really, really receptive to that, okay. to that argument um, and that information like oh yeah we should be able to look and see what's going on in our in our macbooks you know? yeah but we can't yeah. maybe we won't but someone should be able to okay so, so you did have a good positive experience yes. i know that's one of the challenges i think people face i've talked to people about migrations um in the past and you know one of the issues is that um people sometimes try to approach them in different ways maybe by saying like you can download this for free and i'm the word free obviously is sort of overloaded as an operator in our community. So I think it's really important for us to talk about effective ways to communicate. Starting with the four freedoms is a great way. Um, maybe giving them an example. So sometimes, for example, I'll talk about the OLPC project, which in some ways has been um, less of a success. I don't want to say failure, but less of a success. But one of the things it did was it gave young students um, the opportunity to use open machines. And, you know, it might have been a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a photo op, but for example, there were some um, uh, photos up on, uh, you know, the, uh, the OLPC um, project's website um, and, uh, you know, of kids repairing like the X01s. And so it sounded like at least in several of the deployments, not only were they telling them like, here's this computer, you can use it. Um, you can change the software. But as a part of that process, there was a period where they showed them how to, say, replace a screen, a broken screen. And so the act of giving them tools 
And, you know, I mean, I'm sure with like, you know, all kinds of deployments of laptops, iPads, etc., um, there's a certain portion of the class in which they tell them exactly how much they're gonna be on the hook for if they break it. Um, you know, and so, um, and so they, of course, would never take any type of tool to it to look inside. So I think that that is sort of a, on the extreme end, in, in, a good, in a good way, of giving people the opportunity to really be hands-on um, with something that can be open. And so, yeah, you, there are these pictures of like nine, 10 year old girls, like, and they have this like little uh, um, sign up on the wall that says like laptop repair club or something. And they're the ones who are taking the lead on say fixing screens or other components. And again, I think it's partially because they don't have, um, they didn't have an expectation they couldn't do it. Um, so, you know, we really are telegraphing to people whether they should expect um, a certain, um, interaction with their technology. And if we tell them, like, here's how you can fix a computer, they're going to expect that's something that they should be able to do and they can do. But if we tell them, you shouldn't open up your, your laptop, your tablet, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break and you're going to be out at $800, you know, which is, of course, probably some huge number um, to people, um, then, you know, I think that students are going to become more afraid of technology and they're going to become much less receptive to the idea that open is a good thing. Um, they're going to think, well, someone else should deal with that. So, um, have any of you guys tried to work with open file formats at all? Migrations to open file formats? You have? Yeah, how'd that go for you? Well, for me, it's been a matter of just basically switching from the whole idea of using Microsoft Office form formats and then going to uh, the LibreOffice and open ODF, ODF style. Yeah. And also, like, for instance, whenever I apply for a job, they either want Microsoft document format yeah. or they want PDF. Sure. And I'm always going to go for PDF because that's the more open standard sure. and only that, but that keeps my for formatting as well. So for me, yeah. it's been a little bit easier, but at the same time, there are, it, it's hard to get that interoperability so much. Sure, that's that's definitely a challenge. Um, I know that one of, the, one of the problems people face, as you were saying, is that when we're often talking about um, document exchange, we're looking... As, as, a, as a technologist, somebody who does some, some consulting, you know, we're often looking for opportunities to reduce barriers to communication. And so as a result, um, I've had jobs where someone said, you know, we're gonna pay you to write AGPL code. And um, I wasn't actually the one who came up with a license um, for that code, someone, some other academic actually advised this, this professor. And I was like, that's amazing, like that you picked this, you know, very open license. Um, that basically is, is very friendly to m what I'm writing and what we're writing and sharing with um, a lot of institutions, um, libraries, um, and, and archives. But it was frustrating because as a part of the setup of that process, we said, well, let's all get on, you know, they said, let's all get on Skype and chat about it. And so I kind of had to make this decision, like, I can get paid to do six months of work um, on a project by a nonprofit, so I wasn't, you know, making, making uh, making tons of gold, but um, to get paid to work on this AGB, AGBL project um, for libraries, um, for archives, it was a really cool project. Um, but then on the back end, I was gonna have to use Skype and some other tools, and so I eventually um, uh, had, a, had a tablet um, that uh, it was like a HP touchpad, actually, one of those fire cell tablets. And so I was like, okay, I can put um, Android on that uh, device, I can put Skype on that device, and I can use it. And I felt a little bit better somehow, I'm not sure if it was rational, that I could sort of relegate Skype to this one device and say, okay, I'm going to use it for this, I'm going to try to avoid using it for anything else. But it was a trade-off. And I think that we often have to make those trade-offs. Um, this morning, Karen talked about, say, using Replicate on her smartphone. And I don't know if any of you guys have used it at all or looked at it, but it's, it's basically a much less featureful version of Android because it takes out binary blobs, it takes out other um, components for which we don't have source code. So I know that for a lot of us, when we, when we make a decision about software freedom, you know, we're often deciding to have less features, at least in the short term. And I know that can be a really big challenge, especially when your girlfriend wants to chat or uh, someone else wants to collaborate with you in a certain way. So um, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think part of that is basically trying to identify some of the biggest roadblocks for ourselves. Um, so migrations need really careful planning. Um, I have a great story about LibreOffice migrations. Um, there, was a, there was a guy overseas who saw that LibreOffice was a great product. Um, he could get it for free, at least download it for free. And so he's talking to some of the people internally um, at LibreOffice. Um, they're all buddies. And I hope this is a joke. I hope it's a joke. But he said, I'm going to migrate my bank over to using uh, uh, LibreOffice. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that's really cool. Like, you know, like, um, excellent. 
And, um, and so he said, you know, what's your migration strategy? We have some white papers on the LibreOffice website. We have some, you know, really cool tools for you to use. And he said, oh, I was, I was thinking about installing it on, uh, on Friday night, you know, like Friday, Saturday. And the guy was like, and what's step two? And he's like, well, they, you know, they come in on Monday. And, <laughs> and but no, I mean, there are people that seriously think like this, right? I mean, uh, I think we'd be great. I mean, I, I would love it if LibreOffice were a drop and replacement in a lot of ways, right? If people could, could use it. I mean, I don't know if you hear stories. We hear stories about putting, someone put, maybe putting Ubuntu, um, you know, or, uh, you know, a GNOME desktop or something um, on their parents' machine and then telling them this is like Windows 9. Or, you know, Windows, I guess they canceled 9 because it was, you know, a string problem. So this is Windows 10, right? And, and, but people don't know, right? They look at it and they're like, oh, it's new and it's exciting and different. So for a, to a certain level, yes, um, consumers won't necessarily know that this is something that's different. Um, and as long as you give them some shortcuts that say browser and email, um, then they can kind of continue along um, in, their, in, in, their own, uh, in their own way. But the reality is that a lot of our tools aren't drop-in replacements right now. And so we need to be cognizant about what hurdles people are going to face. Uh, people are going to face. Um, one of the challenges that, that I have had, and I think a lot of us do, is that it's sometimes difficult to talk to people, and it's difficult to talk about shortcomings. Because a lot of pieces of free software, we would wish that they were exactly compatible with their proprietary alternatives, but they're not. And I think it's really important for us to address that up front. It doesn't need to be the first thing out of your mouth, but it needs to be in that first conversation. So that when people come up and talk to me, they're like, oh, I, you know, what is this LibreOffice thing? Can I download it? Can I use it? Yes, yes, yes. You know. Will, will it replace Microsoft Office? You know, I try to tell people, look, this has a lot of the same functionality. We have really good support for file formats. But what we provide is a different product. And so you, know, you need to be cognizant about those differences. By telling people up front about the differences, by helping to address some of those concerns, I think we can build a much better relationship with people that might use our software or use our file formats. So what are um, some of those differences that you mentioned? Yeah, so for example, um, LibreOffice implements a lot of different um, uh, pieces of the OXML specs, so the XML formats created by Microsoft. So if you have a docx um, file, we're processing document, you can bring that into LibreOffice or we can write docx. But there's still some compatibility issues there. Um, complex tables, I know there's some issues. I know there's some issues with line drawings. And we try to address those and fix those, right? But we have a limited amount of developer time and there is a large body of different pieces inside the OXML spec. There are other issues that we face where um, Microsoft, so Microsoft basically took their representation of the document and created the OXML spec out of that. And that's kind of what happened with us too. So the ODF spec is, has a history of coming from the star office spec, the star office binary files um, turned into an XML format. So it's interesting that both formats actually come out of the formats and representations that were used by Office products first. Um, I guess it's, you know, kind of a practical, represent, a practical way to create a format because it says as long as the format can represent everything the Office suite does, then it's pretty featureful. But the reality is that because of the history of these formats, that means that Microsoft implements some of the stuff they wrote down in a slightly different way. So it wasn't like, you know, we had a spec first and then implement it twice. Um, in some ways, the features for uh, Microsoft, at least, were implemented first. Um, and this means that so that when LibreOffice tries, uh, LibreOffice developers try to read that spec, that means that sometimes we'll implement things differently. Um, and you know, I would love to have a, a much better lifeline between the two groups, um, but you know, that's that's not always possible um, to discuss. You know, what some esoteric component means. So that so, line that you said between yeah. LibreOffice and Microsoft, Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. How is that changing? Because all of a sudden, Microsoft is open source, right? Well, I think they said something recently. They love it. Yeah, and I don't know what's up with that. Uh, Halloween documents, right? I mean, like, it's... So, as a, as a for instance, so um, I was at a conference, and a um, uh, someone from within Microsoft came up and talked to me. Um, and he seemed really excited um, because his statement was that Microsoft was changing, and I, I've no lot... Some of my best friends are Microsoft employees, right? <laughs> no, they are, they are actually. Uh, but um, and uh, it's interesting. Um, so I've talked to some people, and I think that on an individual level, a lot of people want to um, conform to the spec, and they want they believe in interoperability. I think that um, sometimes uh, on a larger scale, on a corporate level, that might not be their primary focus. I know that Internet Explorer is, uh, you know, the whole browser wars thing. Internet Explorer got kind of beat down for a while, and so as a result. Um, you know, I don't know if they changed out the engineering team or not, but they basically put a lot of really good people on Internet Explorer. And as I understand, it is becoming much more standards compliant because 
uh, Chrome um, and Firefox to a, to, a, to a certain extent, but basically have um, taken their place as some of the best implementations of what people want on the web. And so as a result, Microsoft is trying to compete on correct implementation of features now. And that's, that's what I've heard from developers. They're like, you know, we really want to be um, the gold standard, I think they said, in implementing the, the open web. And it was, I, I was kind of shocked. Right? I was like, Microsoft wants to implement this? And I think the thing is that there is an emphasis from a number of different proprietary software manufacturers where they want to build a product and make a profit. And I understand that. Um, but I think that one of the best things we can do um, from the free and open source software community is to get them to commit to at least conforming to standards. So um, we talk about interoperability. Um, Microsoft Office right now supports ODF. A lot of people don't know that. Um, they supported it, I think, since 2010 natively. And before that, there were plugins, some of which were created by companies that worked on OpenOffice and LibreOffice. But that exists because organizations um, and, and countries and, and, and uh, municipalities within countries have requested it. They said, we're going to standardize on ODF. And so um, similar to the community saying, you know, we want to have standards, countries often have a lot, lot larger weight on that. So that is... Are you referring yeah. to like the UK? The UK is one of them, yeah. But I mean, um, for example, France has uh, converted over, when well, the process of converting over 70,000 desktops to use Ubuntu and LibreOffice. So, um, you know, they made a decision to go with this, um, you know, open source software, free, freedom source software solution um, on their national police desktops. Um, but other countries have decided to use ODF as the standard and have left it up to some of the municipalities to decide how to implement that. And I think that Microsoft said, well, wait a second, like, we want to get a piece of that pie. And so they've agreed to, to, to use ODF. Um, so, yeah. Um, so the bigger, pe uh, bigger picture, um, you want people to use your software, and I'm, I'm talking from an organizational standpoint. I don't know how many of you guys, how many of you guys work on freedom source software in an organization or developers? A few of you guys. Cool. Awesome. Hey, half of you. Um, so obviously part of the process of trying to get people um, to use open source software um, is, is going to be trying to proselytize or try to talk yourself um, with other groups. Um, so there's this great potential for uh, symbiosis. Keys to a successful migration. So you want to discover which projects can serve your needs and which can benefit from your tools. Often you're going to know what tools you need because you're already using them or someone else is already using them. But sometimes there are a lot of entities that you don't know need what you have. So I continually, excuse me, continually meet educators at conferences who don't know about LibreOffice and who say, this is perfect, I can use it in the classroom. And they say, why don't you know about us? And it's because um, we don't communicate, right? We, it's very difficult for us to have that, that level of communication. Um, I've looked around. If you guys have any suggestions for conferences that LibreOffice should go to, I looked around. There are a couple of educational conferences that cost several thousand dollars to attend. Um, and so it's difficult for us, I, th I think, to make that connection um, with educators. Um, government might be a little easier to, to connect with. Um, but having that communication is, can be really tough. Um, maybe that's why they have make yeah. it so expensive. So that to keep out the keep riffraff? Out the, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. That's, it's quite possible. Um, you know, I, I've been looking at some other conferences um, besides things that are just based on free and open source software um, or, or hardware conferences. And yeah, I mean, I think the emphasis isn't on um, the emphasis, there's, there's a big emphasis on sales. And so I know that that's uh, not necessarily. Um, what we might do at a conference, although maybe having representation from one of the companies that has a business around LibreOffice would be a better fit for that kind of conference. Um, you know, and that's something a lot of different projects have people that consult or businesses built around their projects. And so trying to make the business case for them to go to a conference, I mean, I know some of them are, are smaller. They're not some of the biggest um, businesses out there. So, but you know, a few thousand bucks to go to a conference might be a, a wise investment. Um, Is there a company so. that provides like, support for for, in LibreOffice, yeah. So there are a number of them. Um, there aren't um, many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There aren't many in the United States right now, and I think it's a chick, partially a chicken egg problem um, that basically there aren't that many deployments. So I've talked to people who are interested in, in working on that. If any of you guys are interested in starting up a company or know of people who are, um, talk with me. Um, you know, I, I divide my time up on, amongst a lot of things, but I think that um, I could help give some advice about how that process could happen. Um, because LibreOffice could definitely be a, a, a useful component um, in many different 
different yeah, places. Canonical so. hasn't branched out because they, that's their model. Yeah, like I, Red Hat or something. I, I've talked to people at Canonical and Red Hat. I mean, I work with a number of them. And I think one of the things is a lot of those big companies are looking at large deployments. So Red Hat does have a group um, looking at um, open source education on campus, which is partially targeted also at recruitment. So they're looking to have education in the classroom involves, involving using open source, and, you know, probably Red Hat, uh, Linux or Fedora would be you know, part of the, what they'd encourage. Um, but I think that their, their scope is often larger, and their support contracts are usually somewhat larger. I mean, uh, talking to universities, they will often have contracts with Red Hat for their servers and things. But I think that the desktop is a difficult and sort of fragmented place. And so as a result, that can be really tricky for um, a lot of different um, uh, businesses, big businesses like Red Hat and Canonical. So, All right, um, I know we got started late, so I'm going to sort of zoom through, uh, through some of these things. Um, but you want to identify barriers to migration, um, and uh, you want to make sure that you look to novel ways uh, to, to encourage migration or encourage collaboration um, between projects. So discovering projects. Um, which projects do you want to use? I started to touch on this. Um, one of the biggest problems that I've had in terms of migrating to free software and getting people to use LibreOffice is establishing contacts, because a lot of people are very spread out. Um, conferences are a great place to talk to people um, because it's much easier to read people <laughs> in those places. If you guys have ever tried to hop on IRC and talk to a project, it's like talking to a brick wall that doesn't talk back for hours, at least in my experience. Whereas when you meet someone at a conference, um, you know, they might be shy, but they will often talk to you. So I think that having that conversation is, uh, is pretty important um, and, uh, and maybe can be, can be very helpful um, for you. Identifying proprietary software. Um, what are you using in your organization? As I said, I use Skype sometimes. Um, we've been trying to work on video chat tools recently, um, but you might have something else in your organization that you're trying to identify and replace a proprietary CRM, um, maybe some type of uh, uh, accounting tool. Um, if you guys know, uh, so actually Karen works for the Software Freedom Conservancy, and they are having problems with accounting tools, so they took the initiative and started writing one. <laughs> so that's a novel approach towards migration and adoption, but it is something that you can try to undertake. Um, and one of the best things I can say is that trying to either crowdsource or sort of crowd develop, community develop a project is not out of the question. Um, I've seen some increasing uh, benefits, increasing um, successes in people wanting to crowdfund specific little changes for LibreOffice. Um, and so I think that in the future, I really would love to get some of the movers and shakers, maybe board members, from different nonprofits in one room and ask them, like, what is it that you want and what could you most benefit from? So that might be an accounting tool. Um, that might be some other type of tool that I don't know about because I don't usually operate on the board level. Um, and maybe that's something that we could work on. Maybe it's something that we could communally work to fund so that they could take one more piece of their software um, and convert it over to a, to a free alternative. Um, proprietary software has problems with interoperability. Um, I mentioned that Microsoft Office um, recently added ODS support, um, but there's still problems about interoperability that we face, um, such as fonts in Microsoft Office. This is like half the bugs I, I, I face, eh, like a quarter are people saying, like, my layout looks wrong. It's like, we can't ship those fonts. Like, we can't implement this piece. So that's, that's a very big challenge. Um, education, uh, as I mentioned, basically try to be up front with your limitations and say, look, that's a font we can't use, but there's an alternative um, that you can, you can implement instead. So is there, that's an interesting because I yeah, yeah, I can go back. got into that board of people. Where, what is your recommendation for making uh, the fonts look similar? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What are the workarounds? Yeah. So, so there are a family of fonts that are metric compatible with a lot of the fonts that Microsoft ships. Um, and there, there was originally, they're made by the same uh, font foundry, I think. There originally um, a group called the Liberation set of fonts, and I think it was funded by Red Hat. And then Google uh, sponsored a set of fonts um, along with Android um, that were called something else. <laughs> I can't, droid, 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 something, but they're, they're, I can't what the family's called. And so basically, um, those fonts are distributable, and we basically include a lot of those inside LibreOffice and other tools. So I think, like for example, it's like Calibri. I think is one of those. There are a lot of C fonts for their, I guess, Microsoft name all you know C numbers, uh, C names. Um, and we have free replacements. Excuse me for those um, for a lot of those, um, but not for all of those. And does that automatically so, get mapped when you 
Yeah. yeah, so that all gets mapped. And as a little quick thing, if you ever open up a document inside LibreOffice and the font um, name up in the bar is in italics, that means that a substitution is, has occurred. Okay. So I don't think that we, m we indicate if it's been a font metric compatible substitution, but I think that um, maybe we should. So you can say like, oh, this is an equivalent layout versus this is just a best guess match um, between those tools. Um, so um, free software isn't a perfect panacea. I mentioned, you know, talking about your, um, talking about your uh, shortcomings up front so people understand that. Um, it's, it's tough because um, I've tried to use um, WebRTC tools. Um, there's one called Talkie.io. Um, you've got um, the Jitsi, um, Jitsi Meet. Um, tools and those in my experience they work on some browsers not on others um, trying to get cross-platform uh, chat working is very tough so again a fallback I often meet an IRC right now um, but um, but again I think that and I've had conversations for example with uh, some of the people from Mozilla about this because I had some issues with Firefox so you're gonna have to invest a little time to try to fix some of these bugs but I think that one of the best ways to approach this is to try to get multiple players involved. So um, I'm really bad at delegation, but <laughs> if you can try to have that group of people together and say, look, like we've got four projects that need web chat working, um, then you can actually split up some of that work amongst those four projects and not try to take all that weight on your own shoulders. Um, which projects should you use your software? Um, all of them, you should try to. Um, so, um, you know, even, even if, um, you know, your software isn't something they're going to use all the time, um, try to think about what you can give to that project. Um, again, maybe, for example, you can talk to them about how you can provide them some special training. Maybe if they're not extensively using your software, um, you, can, you can give them something else, um, help them out with something they're working on. Um, so I'm going to zoom through here really quickly. Important to, ah, yes. Consult the project members. Even <laughs> enough. So um, this happens with all of our bug reports, but I've had this also from other projects. I've had people from other projects come in and say, LibreOffice doesn't work, and it's horrible, and we're going to leave and never use you again. And then we're like, which project were you from again? Like, OK, thanks, thanks, thanks for stopping by. So um, again, it seems weird maybe to point this out, but it is really important to try to have a diplomatic member of your community um, establish that relationship. Um, so before you talk to somebody, make sure of the details. This has bitten me before. I feel really bad about saying. But I've occasionally gone off to a project and been like, why do you come to LibreOffice and say this and, and do this? It was actually before LibreOffice. Then, but, but um, you know, why do you say this about our project? Like, we're working really hard. And then I find out, you know, this person is, you know, some gray beard that totally understands what he's talking about. And he, in painful detail on IRC channel, explains exactly why I have failed to understand the situation. So, um, and I was like, I will leave now and come back in a couple weeks. Um, so, yeah, make sure, um, you know, w when you take someone to task, um, there are a couple of great people in the LibreOffice community that are great at diffusing situations. When someone comes, comes to the mailing list and says, you know, why are the Windows build instructions not working? So, you know, you can always have a little judo move, like, oh, that's really bad. Like, um, could you help us write documentation about that? Or that's, that's not working very well. I understand that. Like, let me see if I can give you a little bit of a tidbit, and then you can give us something back. Um, and often then people get even more upset. You can see that they're actually, you know, not rational. Or sometimes they'll say, great, here's, here's a patch, here's some code. So, um, you know, it's really easier to step up your rhetoric um, as necessary um, than, to, than to back down. So um, I mentioned building relationships. Try to find someone in the community um, that you can, you can talk to. Um, and as an example, um, here are some of the people. Um, there are a couple people I know that... Um, I don't think Open Hatch and a bunch of you know giving talks here, um, but I know people that, that work for all these different groups right that are here at the LibreOffice, and there are more of them. So face-to-face -face meetings are a great sort of, I say neutral, but a much more comfortable environment for you to establish these relationships. Um, I'm probably running out of time, so I'll run around. Barriers, yes, avoid barriers. I like this picture. Um, sometimes there are people that don't want to, to interact um, with you or with your project. Um, both outside projects and within your project, you will face barriers. Um, it's really difficult. Um, we've had some members inside our, our community who, you know, we wanted to maybe try something new. We want to try a new piece of free software. And they basically said, no, I'm going to leave if you do this. And we had to make a decision. This is extremely tough 
because sometimes you're going to have a, a member who does an amazing amount of work to your community. Um, and I think it's very difficult um, to make a decision about whether you're going to alienate someone that you think is critical to your project um, or whether you're going to you know, choose a better long-term path for your project, maybe a free software project that you think will help you in the long term. Um, but I think it's really important. So I encourage you guys to be bold. And again, remember, be tactful. But, um, but to tell, it's, feel, feel free to tell somebody, look, like, we want to try this, this tool out. We want to try this better solution. Um, you know, you need, to, you need to understand that, that we've made this decision as a community. And of course, as my good friend uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who was born on my birthday, well, before, but um, it's, it's really difficult to change things. I'm not a time traveler, I swear. So. Only, only 500 years old. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, leveraging outside partners is important. Um, a little sort of case thing. Um, Core Boot, as some of you know, is a replacement for proprietary BIOSes. Um, I really wanted to use it a while ago, but I didn't have a, um, anything I could, I could use it on. I have a T60P laptop, which now has support, but it's a scary proposition for me to replace uh, the, uh, the BIOS on that chip. What's cool um, is that there was a Core Boot install party at Libre Plan 2013, and I was way too busy to, to participate. But the idea there were people that could hold my hand gave me a lot of confidence that I could actually implement that. And so, you know, think about what you can do to help migrate people yourself or as a part of your community, um, you know, to make sure that you understand. Uh, sorry, am I? Okay. You started late, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, wait, if you could wrap up. Yeah, I'll try to. Um, so basically, see if, you, see if your help um, as a community can basically reduce the overhead that people need to have to use your software, whether that's tutorials, um, whether that's um, parties, other, other events. LibreOffice happens to be running an event tomorrow at UW um, where we're going to be having a hack fest and having a bug triaging bee. And, um, you know, just between me and you, like, of course it's so that we can, you know, get work done. And it's also, primarily, so that we can meet people and talk to them about the community, right? So we can actually tell them, look, like, working with us, with us is a fun thing to do. It's not a difficult thing to do. Um, I think I expect to see a lot of people there that otherwise wouldn't be able to participate in the project. And that's really analogous to people using your software, right? It's like there are a lot of people that don't think they can use the software, aren't sure how to use it. So having an opportunity to lower the barrier uh, to participation or use um, is one of, your, one, of your best, uh, one of your best goals. All right, well, I should probably wrap up there because we're running out of time. Um, but I um, probably have one minute for questions if anyone has any. Or if we could do questions in the expo hall. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's fine. I'm sorry. Anyhow, thank you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry.